So we're live now. Hopefully people will join. We did get four more attendees from your share, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's just been really haphazard just because we scheduled this so far in advance. I even, you know, I didn't realize just you know to send you the promotional materials, so I apologize. Yeah, no, and I just just to get <laughs> the other day, so I thought I should I should have thought about it earlier as well, but that's all right. Good. Oh, we have we have twenty eight with us already. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Um, so I guess we can start now. This is great. So hi, everyone. Um, welcome to everyone joining us for today's session, another Sun Explained Talk. Um, my name is Valenza, and I work at um, Sun Talk. We're a charity based in South London with an aim to improve social and emotional outcomes for children and young people with um, SEN and their families. Um, so when you're, that you're joining us live, uh, feel free to add your questions in the chat, it should be on the right hand side of your screen. And we'll get to those questions um, after the presentation today. Um, if you're watching the YouTube recording, you can just add your comments to the comment section below and continue the discussion. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so today we'll be joined by Holly Bridges. Uh, we're very fortunate. She's an award-winning Australian therapist, keynote speaker, and an author of the internationally acclaimed book, Reframe Your Thinking Around Autism. Holly has developed the Autism Reframe Therapy Program, ART, in other words, which incorporates the principles of co-design and brain plasticity. She works with families and practitioners, teaching techniques to help restore the connection between the brain and the nervous system. Through her critically acclaimed book, Holly has helped thousands of parents, autists, educators, and therapists perceive a more positive and helpful way of perceiving autism. And she has affected hundreds of families from the severely challenged and nonverbal to adults with Asperger's right through to the very young with her simple and effective art uh, techniques. So we're very happy to have you here. Welcome, Holly, and I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you for having me. It's nice to see you again. Um, uh, what I'm going to do today is share my screen and go through a PowerPoint that explains the polyvagal theory and the vagus nerve, which is what all my work's based on. Um, and that's probably the most simple and fun way of going through it. So we're going to do that for about 30 minutes and then stop and then have about 15 odd minutes for questions. So hello, welcome. I'll share my screen. It won't be a minute. How's that? Is that good? Okay, I'm hoping that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, Valenza. So, yeah, this is my this is my work. This is my book, um, which I wrote. Uh, I don't know about eight years ago or something now, um, a little while ago. And I wrote it because there was this wonderful theory, and I got really excited about it because it made such amazing sense to me. And no one was really much talking about it. So I I couldn't help myself. I just um, had to put something together. And so it's really gone from there. Um, I've, I've got, as Valenza said, I have an award from the National Disability Service here in Western Australia for my work. And it's kind of quite different to what other people are doing. And so I'll give you a, a small gist of that as we go. Um, so this is just me. <laughs> um, and then this is, oh, no, that's not. So, yeah, so being me, I have um, consider myself on the autism spectrum. I wrote this book because I got really excited about what the possibilities for therapy for people and explaining autism in a way that was far more interesting and useful than anything I'd really read before. And so a whole lot of things click clack together for me and made a whole lot of sense. Um, and then I went, after I wrote the book, I went and worked in autism services for a number of years and got a really good gist of how things are run and what people are doing um, with a wide range of people. And I just, 
uh, with all my experience with brain plasticity and all sorts of things I've learned in my, you know, past life, I, I just knew there was something more interesting to do. So for me, there's a, there's a really long history of the way that we work with autism and it's based very heavily in some pretty outmoded ideas about what autism is. And so while there's a lot of evidence-based practice, there's, uh, there's a lot of criticism these days for the kind of work people are doing um, for people on the spectrum from autism advocates worldwide and from people who've grown up in the system and are challenging the dominant ideology with, with autism therapy. And this, I drew this picture because it's like um, the Stephen Covey seven principles of success or whatever it's called. I think I've got it in the next slide where everyone's so used to cutting through the undergrowth and working their way through things and doing as you're supposed to be doing because that's what's done and it has 30, 40, 50 years of, of research telling you why and then there's policies and manuals and all this um, justification. However, times change and things move and they have in the autism field very much in terms of advocacy, as I said, but also we've learnt a lot in the last 20 years on brain plasticity and body cognition and body psychology that it really is time that we upgraded to something different. And so that's, you know, that's what I see my role was as writing the book is to sort of start to bring awareness of that. But then what I did was created a therapy that I'm so excited about and so delighted about. Um, so I'll share a little bit more about that with you. That's This is what it looks like in practice my work um it's it's really gentle work it's working physically with people um but it's it's got quite a different slant to the regular ot and the regular speech kind of work so i'm hoping you'll get an idea of that mostly from going through the polyvagal theory and the vagus nerve and then what what that means so usually we look at autism in terms of deficits and things people can't do um, and then we try and manage that as best we can and we don't see a lot of room for change and we don't see a lot of room for progress and we don't also describe a lot of beauty. Like when you look at Leo Kanner and Hans Asperger who were writing about this you know, quite a long time ago now, they had special abilities at the top of their list for people on the spectrum and now it's very diminished into something that's um, really deficit oriented. So there's, there's a lot of scope there. And also, if you're working with people and you have a deficit model, I don't think you can get very far. There's a real glass ceiling for what, what you think you can have and then what you're allowing um, to be changed and, and challenged within the therapeutic setting. We know from all sorts of things that we have done with people on the spectrum that physical stuff works it calms people it soothes people we know that foods and and taking care of diet and, and being sensitive to that helps but we never really have an explanation of why it's just oh that's autism so we're sort of always playing with this very nebulous thing called autism that we don't know we can't define there's no part of the brain that's got autism it's this this um very um elusive um, kind of uh, thing, sorry for that's terrible language, um, and, and so all we've been able to do is say what it isn't in a sense, but we know that physical therapies are useful. Aside from physical therapies, we do cognitive behaviour management very often and so we teach people how to be uh, manage themselves and how to think and how to operate in a world that they don't particularly understand or particularly relate to. And we teach strategies like zone red, zone yellow, etc., um, to try and explain to someone with this deficit how to cope. The trouble is a lot of people I see and speak to say, I get these strategies, I understand it. It's just I can't apply it when things go haywire. I can't stop myself going into that place. So while it can be explained like this, it's not really something that I can use. 
And so there's a sort of this disparity between the intelligence of the person and sometimes the strategies that we're teaching and employing. And also these, these cognitive kind of therapies are very focused on behaviour and outcomes and how we ask other people and self-management, which, uh, again, implies deficit. And it's also not um, about your well-being. It's about other people and it's about fitting in enough. And while that isn't a bad thing, I think we can expand what we're doing for people um, so that there's a more holistic way. Also, it's very intellectual to do that kind of stuff. And so it's quite difficult, not because people are stupid, because they're not, they're really, really smart, but they often have difficulty accessing their executive functioning and they have difficulty accessing their working memory. And because anxiety is very much a body state as opposed to a mental state. When you go into anxiety, your body has gone there first and it actually hijacks your brain. So it's very, very challenging for people um, to kind of access their body in order to regulate it, which is what you essentially have to do. 10% of us is intellect and 90% of us is autonomic, which means that we our bodies operate without us being in charge of them. So we can be efficient and get on with our day. Um, the difficulty is that people on the spectrum often have an autonomic system that's running away with them and they can't really control it. So they're often in flight or fight or they're often in an immobilised state. And so what happens when we do these cognitive-based therapies often or often enough is that they fail because the what you're asking someone to do is a really challenging um, configuration for them. So I'll have people that come to me and they're at uni and they are really, really bright, but they go, I just, all the stuff that I've been asked to do, different therapies, I, I can't do them and I still can't leave the house and I'm still miserable and I'm really depressed and et cetera, et cetera. But they feel like they failed Whereas my challenge is perhaps the therapies are failing these people instead. And what I'm seeing in the work I'm doing is that they are improving dramatically and rapidly in the ways that they want to by working with the body instead of cognitive focused therapies. So we know that autism is about the body. We also know that people with autism have gut problems, digestion, taste, food intolerances, sensory issues, vestibular proprioception issues, touch issues, pain intolerance. All this is very body oriented as well. And we don't really, again, have a really good reason for why. And then what we do is we individually deal with all of these issues and manage them at best and sort of go, again, well, that's just autism. But there's no sort of... Um, foundational way of understanding all of this and then directing our therapies in a sense to something that may be more cohesive. As people get older, there's all sorts of other things that go on at a body level because even depression and anxiety, when you look at it, are just uh, quite different now we're finding from what we used to say is a brain disorder with depression and etc we're finding that it's just a massive consistent overload for the system and people get overwhelmed and just stay there and go into shutdown and you'll see what i mean in a minute but again there's all these physical aspects to living in an autistic body or having an autistic mind that we don't really um fully understand because we've labelled it a brain pathology. So there's this huge gap between what's going on in the body and then the intellectual work that we're asking people to do. Um, and I've found that it's very well met by this theory. The theory is by a chap called Stephen Porges. He's an American neurobiologist and he's brilliant. He's loved worldwide for this theory that's probably about 25 odd years old now and it's a way of talking about how the brain and body interact and what happens when the brain and the body stop talking to each other and so this theory is applied to trauma to bipolar disorder um, 
borderline personality disorder, depression, anxiety, a whole range of things. And there was a very small portion in this very challenging book about autism and it just thrilled me. So I wrote the Dr. Zeus version of it um, and Steve Porges was very kind and wrote the foreword to my book. And he has also since had a look at my work and he's been really complimentary about that, um, which has been really nice. But it's a it's a really well-loved book because it is, when people read it, they just go, well, that makes so much sense, you know? And it's it's that this isn't actually wildly fantastical. When I go through it, you'll really see what I mean. And I think that's the beauty of it. And there's a simplicity to this and there's a simplicity to the work that we miss because we go down, there's this massive brain pathology thing going on when when maybe there isn't. Maybe there's an exquisitely new evolutionary brain happening. Um, who knows? We actually don't know what autism is. So the polyvagal theory is the body has alert response to pain and fear and can go into an involuntary shutdown as a safety mechanism. Belenza, can you give me a nod when I'm five minutes up, please? So within that safety mechanism, we have a sliding scale of safety options. And all mammals have these safety options. So in this sense, we're no different from the lions and the tigers and the bears. We all have a physical system that allows us to engage in being in the world. So our social engagement system is our newest evolutionary function. And as I said, all mammals have this system. We just then employ it with a, you know, fairly upgraded brain in terms of executive functioning, etc. In order to be able to use your social engagement system, which is your connection to your eyes, ears, face, voice and heart, you have to be in a good enough physiological place. You have to be kind of calm enough. Your tummy has to be regulated. Your heart rate needs to be down. There's all sorts of ways in which your neurosensory systems have to be nice and even and you're in a parasympathetic enough state and then you have a really good connection like software to your social capacity. When you go into a flight or fight state, so maybe there's a, you know, a lion way off in the distance. Your body responds. It notifies you that there's something going on. And then your brain kicks in and goes, well, I know what that is. And then you are aware enough on the whole for making some decisions to flight, fight or freeze, kind of um, stop still. And here we're in kind of a sympathetic state. And most of us go through our whole day like this and we can you know, forget to ever be in a really calm place. Excuse me. So where we go into this fright fight thing and it's mostly voluntary and we can kind of stay there. There's also another option, and this is what Porges is saying with his theory, which is brilliant and it's actually nothing new, we've just forgotten, that the body has a capacity to immobilise. So at this point the body takes over it, it deems that lion is getting too close for you to make any responsible decision on, on what's going to make you safe, it will drop you out like a rabbit in a headlight. It will take you out and you cannot use your voice, your face, move your body, etc. at a certain point and you literally just have to wait until it wakes up again because if that lion gets really close and you blink or you murmur, or you move your head or leg or twitch, you're interesting to the lion and then it suddenly becomes a different state of play. Whereas your best opportunity is if the lion's not particularly hungry, it will go away. And so it's your, your body's last strategy for survival and, you know, often it works. We're not supposed to really employ it very often and in this day and age we don't deal with lions so we don't really even think this happens. But the theory with the polyvagal theory and with autism is that the, the physical system has is a lot more trigger happy and, and people sort of more hang out in the flight or fight free state or in the immobilised state, but they're generally sort of milling around that area and they don't have a really good understanding of what it is to be in a body that's really nicely connected and calm with an open tummy, et cetera.
And so they're at the mercy of this physical system. And that's what people say. They say, I'm in a body that doesn't work for me. I can't control myself. I hate getting really angry. I hate not knowing what I said. But they can't control it because they've gone into a disassociated state. And that's what this is. So what we're doing with my work is teaching the body to be more robust, to have another uh, gear on the bike, which is what one client explained it as, so that there's more choice. And the choice isn't particularly intellectual. If the body can learn how to do this, it just doesn't immobilise as much because it's got another option and it's got a level of robustness at a vagus nerve level. So... The vagus nerve is one of the 12 cranial nerves and all the speeches and OTs learn this in first year uni. But as one um, speechy I know really well said, we learned all of this, no one ever put it together like this though. And it's that, this is just a tiny little jump somewhere else and it makes all the difference. So I'm gonna go through all of these because when you actually look at them, it really, really makes sense of autism. The cranial nerves are, olfactory smell and taste so when you're in a flight or fight state that smell and taste goes down so it makes really good sense of why people have food aversions and they they need things to be just so there are so many people that you know can only eat chips it's not that they're being willful it's that their body literally can't take that anything else much in and then it becomes very circular. So we try and take it out of that circular thing with cognitive stuff. But what I'm finding is if you get the body in a better place, things just naturally open up. The optic nerve does vision, brightness, contrast, light reflex. If you can't even see that food properly or the peas on your plate, you can't want to put it in your body as well. But you also, um, five of these are, are eyes, as you can see. And so... We say people on the spectrum can't make good eye contact. If your eyes if, are um, quite fixed, which they are if you've got a lion coming towards you, you don't want to be looking around at flowers at that point and digesting food. You want to be fixated on that lion. So the eyes go really straight ahead and they're, they're more tunnel vision and then that informs our brain and we can get very tunnel vision with things. And what I see when I start working with people gently, kindly and and in no way in a hurry to take them anywhere in particular because it's very, very delicate work, um, they will get peripheral vision. They will go and stare at a tree for ages, you know, a five-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 20-year-old, and it's like they're seeing it for the first time because, because their senses are coming online in a way that they haven't been available to them before. The facial nerve does taste, ears, facial expressions. And this is one people really focus on with the polyvagal theory because of the auditory sensitivities and the lack of um, facial expression, um, uh, which, which was very much a thing I dealt with when I was younger. And, you know, my face still really does turn off if I'm tired. It just does. Vestibular cochlea, hearing and balance. People often have huge issues with this. Taste, glossopharyngeal, information to the brain about tongues, tonsils and swallowing. Again, it just makes food really, really difficult if your body's not in the right place for it. The vagus does the sensory, motor and autonomic functions, glands, digestion, heart rate. And so it actually organises the body connected to all sorts of other things. This is a very, very simplistic model of what's going on because it's enough for what we need to understand. Uh, so when I say the vagus controls it, allow me some leeway. It will take you into a flight or fight state and it will immobilise you. And when it's in the right place, you have access to your social engagement system and a nice, easy digestion and a good heart rate, et cetera. So it's, it's highly influential and it controls all of these other things because it will turn them all down from 10 till 1 if that lion gets too close. And we just are very beholden to our bodies in this way, in a way that we don't really get taught and under, understand anymore. I think we used to know this a whole lot better, but we've pathologized so many things and got out of an orientation of understanding just what an embodied state is because we love the mind and we love being in charge and people who can control themselves are great and people who can't are not. 
Tongue speech swallowing. If you think about having stage fright, being somewhere where you're anxious, you can't use your voice. You you get tongue tied. It's it turns off, and then you have to work within that particular physical choreography. So all we're doing with my work is gently, softly, and very respectfully helping the person come out into a more simple and comfortable physical physical choreography. The vagus nerve is a bidirectional bus route. It takes information from the body up to the brain. It is in all the major organs of the body and it goes up to the brain stem and it, it, it influences so many things. What people often do is do vagus nerve hacking where you get your vagus nerve back into shape and get it back so you can get back to work as quickly as possible or we need to do this so we can make people more socially engaged and I find all of that quite frightening because all of those states are there for a reason. And if you've got someone in a high trauma state or they've never understood a more softer state, you don't want to snap them back anywhere. What we're trying to do is get them to have a greater level of body awareness in their own way. And we're very, very cautious about all the work we do. So my work looks very simple and people will go, run off and go, oh, I'm going to go and run a workshop on this. And they do. And I hear reports sometimes of things that happen where people have got very uncomfortable because your body's, your body's put a defence in place for a reason. So we have to be very, very mindful. Though, although this is simple, it's also um, highly individual and you have to be really, really thoughtful. The vagus nerve influences all of these things. In order to put you in a flight or fight state or an immobilised state, or a nice parasympathetic state. It has to be able to control your HPA axis, your hypothalamus pituitary adrenals. These are issues people have on the spectrum all the time. They're, they're in flight or fight 24 seven. And so it makes sense when you look at the vagus nerve that it's always on. And it's sort of, it's not hijacking this stuff, it's just using it in a certain way. Oxytocin, we give to people in pill form, because it helps calm them down, but it's actually something we make in the body when our body's in a good enough place and it allows social behaviour, bonding and relaxation. The kidneys produce vitamin D, which allows for mood, immunity, digestion of proteins, allows for cellular activity. The kidneys are the adrenals. If your kidneys are on 24-7, you don't have the downtime to make your vitamin D. And so many people on the spectrum are low in vitamin D. It's very, very common. But this makes sense of why. Because the body is never at a point of rest even when people were sleeping. And if you've got people on the spectrum or you are on the spectrum, you'll probably know that this is true. People don't wake up looking refreshed. And they're, they're very um, alert all of the time. They can't get their brain to shut down. That's because the brain is constantly sending danger signals up to the, bra the brain to keep everything on. And so you're in this loop. Gallbladder and colon is influenced. Um, gallbladder does cholesterol and fats. So it, to me, makes sense of why people have issues around that. It's also, um, you don't have as much feeling if you're in an immobilized state and that line gets too close. So you often don't know when you're full or you don't know when you have pain. So a lot of weight issues can be explained by this inability to have interoceptive capacity. Colon and bladder makes, you know, a lot of sense to a lot of people. People have a lot of time trying to control this. And again, we do a lot of intellectual stuff around this. But what I find a lot of the time is when people get their body into a better place, this stuff kicks in and they have this awareness, this interoceptive capacity that you can't take someone to intellectually. But it, it just is natural and naturally comes online when we are appropriately kind to the body. The gut does B12, serotonin, dopamine. It controls it, it's 80 to 90% of the immune systems in the gut. And myelin, although it's not made in the gut, requires um, nutrients from the gut in order to be um, made. So B12 allows us to know who we are. It allows us to sleep well. It allows us to have good brain function. Myelin protects the nerves and helps you feel safe and resilient. And the new vagus nerve, the parasympathetic aspect of the vagus nerve, is highly myelinated. So at a physiological level, if you don't have a lot of myelin because you haven't been able to make it for like 10 years or more, you 
or you haven't since you're a baby, you it's very hard to have a good physiological capacity to be resilient. So what I see is the more we get the body into a good place, all of this stuff starts sorting itself out quite naturally. When you look at serotonin, which is produced in the gut primarily, um, it allows for deep, peaceful states. It regulates intestinal movements and appetite and, and all of these things beautifully. If you don't have it, you have issues with mood, anxiety and psychosis. And so we give people serotonin. But we make it in our body if our body's in a good enough place. And then our body knows how much we need. And it's cyclical. So when you have deep, peaceful states and you can heal and you can be in a good place, you keep doing it because you're you're sort of getting a nice spiral to a place of wellness. Dopamine um, allows for all of this stuff, excitement, reinforcement and reward, executive functioning, cognitive fun flexibility, motor control, motivation, etc. It's all this stuff, eyes. Um, it's synthesised in the brain and the kidneys. So, again, if we're really, really busy, it doesn't get to happen. So we, we're starting to understand just how much our emotional and physical capacity has to do with the state of our body. And we can put as much good food in and as much vitamins as we want, and that can sometimes be really useful. It doesn't always help. And, and I think because the nervous system's just running full tilt all of the time, and unless you um, educate it to sit somewhere differently, you often don't get a whole lot of change. So in a good place, the digestive system is on, and in a completely switched off place, it's seized. And, and people sit anywhere along here on any given day. Um, but I like I just did a session with someone today and, and I just was showing the mum how to do the exercise so that the kid could watch and get a feel for it without having to do it and, and it's a much gentler way to start these things. And she found that her tummy just fully relaxed and it was it was almost an unusual sensation for her except she knows what that feels like. But it was quite swift and nice for her because her head got clear and she felt a whole lot better but in that process it was kind of interesting as well it was very delicate gentle exercise um but it's uh, i guess what i'm saying is we're, we're playing with this very ordinary stuff but it's also not ordinary if your tummy's always been seized and then suddenly it isn't um so we we have to go very gently and thoughtfully lastly the vagus nerve is in the gut and other organs since 80% of sensory information is afferent, which means it goes up to the brain. We always think things are the other way around and the brain's informing all the time. It actually isn't. All, all of your sensory info goes to your tummy first. And so all of that old adage of gut knowledge is actually true. And we're finding that out more and more and more as we're able to investigate the body with more sophisticated techniques. So... When information comes in and you've got a very distressed system because it's been distressed since birth, it it reads in a certain way and anything is kind of read as noxious, more or less, and then it goes up to the brain and then you get this loop of everything's not good and it keeps the ears turned in a certain way so that you can't take in sound, your eyes stay fixed, et cetera, et cetera. And so people live in this loop and all we're trying to do really is retrain the body to read sensory information so that information can come in and it doesn't tripwire the system and make it go offline. And it is surprisingly simple to do. As much as I'm weaving caution into all of my slides because I think it matters um, and we can get very gung-ho, at the other end of it, done well, it's it's surprisingly efficient because the body knows what it wants and it likes feeling better. So we can teach people to feel like this, people on the spectrum, and it's easy, but we also can teach ourselves because everybody has a body. Everyone is well aware of when their body goes into that space. If you think about yourself self in grief or shock, you bang into things, you don't want to eat, you can't talk, you can't handle light, etc. and too much noise, you shut down a bit to protect yourself while your whole neurophysiology is adapting to the external event. And in many ways, 
what's happening for people on the spectrum is that their bodies are constantly in that space that it's been normalised. And it's a very interesting thing to show them and it's very beautiful and I cry all the time, <laughs> all the time, because you are taking them to this entirely new place where they get to feel good and it's it's stunning. Lastly, lastly, sorry, I'll chuck this in at the end because I think it's really important. What we're doing with this work is unlearning. We're employing all of these aspects of brain plasticity, and these are from Nanette Banyol's Nine Essentials, where we have to be highly individual with how we're working with someone and we do engage their cognitive capacity and we do engage them and they're very much front and centre of the work and it has to be meaningful to people and they have to want to do it. You can't tell someone to go to that place or have a checklist and they've got there by the end of four sessions or 50 sessions or something. Sometimes it takes one session and sometimes it takes a lot longer but it's highly individual. And so these are some images from my book. We we, we have to be very attentive to the body and very thoughtful. And then if we can manage that and know exactly what we're playing with, we get, we get some wonderful results. This is um, a picture of my ball exercise, so it's kind of fun. I think I'm nearly done for Lenza, except for we can take people out of a flight or fight or an immobilised state and back into their body so that they get to feel it and mobilise it and use it in a way that is far more comfortable and pleasant to be in. And then the world gets this amazing brain because there's a choice of when they can apply it more fully and um, there's a, every chance it's an evolutionary upgrade. So thank you. I will come for questions. I hope that was half an hour. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Holly. Um, you, you did give me the, uh, you did ask for that five minute mark, but I didn't want to interrupt you on your. <laughs> now I've stopped sharing, but I've got to come back and find you, I think. There you are. There awesome. we go. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's really elucidating. So, if uh, for those watching, if you'd like to add your questions to the comment box, the chat box, um, I'll just give this, give you a few moments. Um, do you have one while you're waiting for questions, or if indeed there are any? Where do, where do you even start with a question? Um, yeah, uh, okay, I'll one. Does it make really good sense to you? To me personally? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, do Having done work, um, some work in sort of the trauma-informed response, um, looking at the brain-body connection absolutely does. I mean, we see, uh, yeah, um, we see this in our service. We, we see, uh, uh, you know, children, um, they're, they're reacting to their body's uh, responses in the world. And, and so it's giving uh, this whole idea of giving that autonomy back with, with that communication is just, seems very organic to me. So. It's wonderful to see it, like you say, I think um, a lot of our um, families and counter practitioners that um, have been trained with this medical model but don't have this connection um, uh, that uh, beyond the Cartesian connection, which is our organ systems are separate and, uh, and here's our brain and uh, the administrative chair of our brain, but I think there's there's a lot more to it. Um, so I think this theory really puts it well together. Um, yeah, yeah. And you find that, like, if you just you, like you do that ball exercise, for example, it shifts your vestibular system because when you're in a certain you know, flight or fight state, your vestibular system, the way you are in time and space, how you move through the world, is oriented in one way and it's talking to your arms and legs and your brain in a certain mm -hmm. mode like a mm -hmm. certain train track and when you do this exercise mm -hmm. it, it shifts the vestibular system and so all of that communication changes as, as much as the vagus nerve does there's all sorts of orientation so I'll get kids especially people can't feel very much so they can't tell when they feel better 
in a way. I'll have a punching mm -hmm. bag in the room and I'll get them to punch at the beginning of the session and kick it, which is always fun. Um, and then I'll get them to do it at the end. And they're like, wow, because their punching is really hard and powerful and their kicking's got, you know, precision. And, and then there's a way in which they can see that their body's got this better orientation from being in a calmer place. Mm -hmm. um, which is just really nice. It makes them quite enthusiastic about doing the work because there's benefits of that. You can do it and play sport better or whatever. Yeah, and, and I, I know we have a few comments here, but one thing I wanted to touch on is um, you said it, it's sort of a different approach to OT, these, uh, I guess, traditional therapies using, but how exactly would you say um, your approach, for example, the you know, using the ball, um, just orienting the body differently? How would you say that it better positions someone to kind of receive? Uh, I think, I mean, I'll, I, have to, I have to be cautious just to so I say it right, and I, I don't know that I'm right, but I think a lot of the stuff we understand with OT has been overlaid with a behavioural model. So we have a sort of thing of checklists and we're going to do this and this in a session and we have a goal. I don't have a goal. The, the thing is to listen to the nervous system. So it's not where, where you might do the ball exercise. Someone might put their feet on it for like a count of three and then off. Or they can't even do the ball exercise because their nervous system is far too delicate. So we're kind of going the other way around where we're not meeting a, a, a schedule, but we're finding what the person can tolerate and then building that. And it can be tiny. So I did a, a session some time ago and the person couldn't um, couldn't do the ball. The acupressure points that I use are really helpful, but she couldn't even do them at all, but she could do her mum's. And so we worked that way. And it still made this incredible influence on her nervous system, but in this very, very differently oriented way. And so I think we... We need to start stopping and listening and interacting at a far more subtle and individual level, and I think we've forgotten how to do that. You know, it's not it's not amazingly new, but the application is in today's world. Mm. I can't see any questions, so you might have to pick one for me. Yeah, so um, we have one from Amy. Not in the comments. Uh, uh, so Amy says, uh, your slides make a lot of sense uh, to me for my son. Um, how can we help our children to be able to do this, to open up if you don't, like, I'm assuming, not having direct access to these therapies with using the art technique? So what activities, exercises, and movements could we be doing at home to kind of... So um, just what I always suggest is you get really familiar with the theory so that you're, we immediately want to jump in and do stuff and, and you know, there's a great reason for that. You want to be really helpful. But learning the subtlety of it really matters first. So I'm, you know, as you can tell from my presentation, a bit of a bossy about this sort of stuff um, because if done well, it's really good, and if it's done badly, you can, you, you can do more harm than good in a sense. I've got a DVD that if your listeners want to get off my website, there's a free code, um, which is SMILE2020, if you want to put that in the comments or something as well. Um, so they can download that and have another look. There's this sort of this presentation and then other stuff, and I've got a couple of the activities that I that I use. Um, and then I also do Zoom work, which works really well. So I work internationally with people all the time. So, And I'm bringing out a, an eight-week um, express course. So that should be ready in a couple of months so people will get a better gist of how to do this kind of stuff. Um, and I'm training some therapists. So um, so it's building in this kind of a way. So go to my website and have a look and, and see where you might want to go from there. And regarding the eight-week course, um, just so we have it, is, is that for parents, carers, practitioners, anyone willing to access it? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a like a more comprehensive um, therapist training course that I'm building. Um, so I'm six months into that with my first group of trainees. But yes, I thought I'd just make a nice 
easy package. And so it's going to be um, sort of blended learning. So one to two hours of work at home a week. So it's not too much. Um, and then a live catch up like this so people can ask questions and kind of engage at that level. And then we'll just do that once a week for eight weeks. So we sort of, you know, have a nice gentle tuition. So I'll send you the info for that as well when it's up, which will be long. And I'll send all this information to our attendees um, afterwards. Um, so I see, I, I see one sort of comment, um, another person, Elaine, um, mentioning it makes a lot of sense. She explains her son's difficulties well and she understands it better. Um, so that's good. Um, I guess since we, if anyone has any more questions to add it in, but I guess I can, I'll ask one last question to kind of round it up. Um, for those parents and carers that want to apply it at home or for practitioners, how can we begin to create space from, you said the intellectual level to back to that physical level to begin appreciating um, sort of how that might sit in the body for a young think, person. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, what I think happens is the more that you can appreciate this point of view, you can see what's happening for people so that, that you can see they're not being willful, they're overwhelmed. And you get more and more subtlety and appreciation around that and trying to, you know, where, within reason, um, you know, make their lives as comfortable as possible. I think also you start attending to your own. Uh, everyone has a nervous system. So the more we can get thoughtful about our own triggers, our own needs when we are or are not in a relaxed place, that sort of thing, so that we can take care of ourselves better and then also know when we can be of use to other people. So it's a bit like the aeroplane mask, I guess, in some respects as well. But I think we make that space, um, we generate it from ourselves as much as anything. And I don't, you know, mothers have this, you know, from refrigerator mother, et cetera, this huge uh, drive to be perfect, desire to be perfect, and then lots of other cultural reasons why they should be perfect. It's not about always being a really good person and being really zen, but it's about understanding the, the way in which we have facility and don't have facility and what's happening for our bodies and the fact that the best way to get to a good place is that to actually be really kind and really gentle. Mm -hmm. So I, I think people on the spectrum really resonate with you when you're coming in from that perspective and you see them and you see through all of the, the attendant lack of facial features, you know, activity or, or um, eye contact and all that sort of stuff so that you, they know you know they're in there. And I, I think that's a really important thing. It's huge. And then when they're not coping, you, you see that too. It's, it's hugely mm -hmm. important. Yeah. yeah um, and I think it was, um, it was from, uh, your, you know, your, your this uh, um, series of, of videos on your, um, your from your website, uh, you mentioned that learning, um, as it's traditionally done in schooling, is this sort of ramming into the brain. It's like, and, and we don't necessarily have appreciate what it means to us. So like this approach that makes space for the individual um yeah. and sort of fers in um kind of uh th these these pieces of learning um and allows it to settle and then to come up see what how the body reacts sort of naturally is a beautiful way i found that really um stood out in my mind is sort of looking at learning but seeding it um and allowing that body learning to kind of come up first would you say um absolutely and i think we, we just we forget or we just don't know how clever our the brain and body are one thing it's just how clever your system is your nervous system it's so sophisticated it doesn't need much and it will take a tiny bit of information and use it really efficiently so if we do too much which i think we do with all of our therapies you know jump over that run over there and blah 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 you're doing all of this stuff there's no actually time for learning whereas what you do otherwise is you have a little bit of movement and then you stop and it's actually in that stopping point 
where people can't close their eyes for more than a count of three and you build up to five and then you build up to 20 or whatever you're doing, but that you're making that space in the middle where there's a stillness. And in there is where all of that sophisticated learning can start changing train tracks and starting to generate itself and understand that point of quiet in there that is just so elusive to people on the spectrum. And so, yeah, it's it's that delicacy and then just remembering that you're playing with something that's inordinately clever. So we, we do more because, and I think it's that glass ceiling with people on the spectrum. We, we infer it's, it's a bit like racism. We we just think they're not very clever. So we give them really dumb things to do half the time. And that's a bit rude to say. There's this deficiency model that's so Im, implicit. So until you tease that out a bit as well so that you're coming in really clean, then you, you know, you can start playing in quite a different way with people because you understand that their system is, you know, 150% clever just because. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's something um, that I know I've seen through working with our families is, is this assumed, we have these standards of competencies, or we have an OT that does a certain test, and it's, you know, if, if this child doesn't pass this test, it's sort of a mark against them. And so looking at competency and body knowledge, and that we're all holding this kind of wisdom about ourselves, that we're experts in our own experience, yeah. uh, so yeah. often is not narrative with with therapies and approaches and you know from an educator standpoint from a you know ot you know from these various practitioners it's this so it's it's almost expanding that definition and saying um there is there's so much sufficient that every individual has and it's that it's making that space to get there right yes and you're building self-confidence you're empowering people you know, if, if 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 I as the therapist know what you need, you've you're disempowered before we've started, and mm. that's the orientation we have most of the time, um, because we've come from a deficiency model, and you know it's being challenged now, but it's been in place for a really long time, and you know all the evidence based practices are funded um, by government and insurance and etc., but they're they're really the antithesis, I guess, of what we're talking about in lots of ways. And that doesn't mean there's nice, not nice people doing nice work. But it is, you know, there's a big autism advocacy movement now really challenging some of the standard therapies for that reason, because of the lack of individual um, decision making and etc. And I, someone, I found your comment, someone asked about the CA. MHS. I'm in Australia, so I'm not entirely sure I know what that is, but is it like yeah. a big government organisation? So that is Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services. So I think that really ties in nicely to what you're speaking of. So we're, we're, look, we're talking about the medical model, um, the medical model defic uh, deficit. So yeah, so she's kind of interesting uh, or asking, have you noticed, at least within Australia, um, influence on, I guess, um, um, public, the public sector or or mainstream um, practices within mental health. Slowly but surely, it's it's really interesting because it's such people protect their work. The organisations have long standing. You've got evidence based practice, so everyone defends that. Um, we're not proficient yet at understanding bodies that the body influences the mind not the other way around so I have had a lot of criticism at different points um, it's changing a lot here so the government are funding my work here now which is really really cool um, and they're getting good reports and good results so I, I think that's generating as well what I'm doing um, in the next few weeks is getting a small case study done with a um, organization in Sydney and so from that we'll have a write-up of a case study and and before and after measures and it's you know it's there that I can start proving this at another level where people will then want to take it seriously so it's really interesting because again there's this big gap because you've got people in grassroots living this experience going well that makes perfect sense and um, applying this work and finding it's really useful but I don't have for obvious reasons 20 years of research backing what I'm doing so it's harder for the big organizations such as the um, 
National Autistic Society or the CMH, CIM, um, to, to be able to connect with it in a sense. But it, it's mm. interesting too. I sit here and then I also, um, there are pockets of the autism advocacy scene that don't like what I'm doing either because I'm working with the body and I'm saying there can be change instead of um, f f autistic pride and you should just be fine just the way you are where mm. I think that's 100% true, but I also know that there's so many issues around the nervous system and, and, and things that are so challenging for people that you want to be able to address that as well. And I think this theory really makes sense of that. So, so it's, a, it's an interesting landscape we're all in at the moment, I think, with, um, with where, we're, where we've been and where we are and where we're progressing to. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point you mentioned on the contrary is, is this sort of standards within ableism. The ableist mindset is saying this is where we want to be intellectually, physically. We want to be, like you said, we sort of revere um, the person who's in complete control. But um, like you said, it's, it's sort of paying attention to the fact these are um, responses and experiences and phenomena that, that happen when your body's closed off to itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, and you really can have as as nice. Sorry to interrupt. As as making your world as comfortable as possible, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your nervous system knows how to go into a really great place. So we can focus on the environment a lot and say, well, if everyone just behaved mm -hmm. better, and you know, I think there's a lot of things that need changing um, in the in the work world and in the education world in order to make life a whole lot more comfortable for people. I a trillion percent think that but then there's also the other end of it where I think people are in a heightened nervous system and it's really useful to to allow them to know what it feels like to be in a body that actually feels nice mm -hmm. absolutely and I think it's one of those things you don't know until you're you're in that state and you can access it and you see um so it's this yeah um it's a spectrum of of capacity building isn't it um Yes. And then and building awareness in the community of these possibilities because it's sort of unheard of. The results I'm getting, you know, in, a, in a, a week intensive, which is like five days in a row and a session prior and two sessions after, the changes are astronomical and they, they, they seem to be lasting. And I do lots of follow ups and people are happier, more resilient, more all sorts of things that they are, but they're. They're just more open and easy in, in their own way. Um, and so I'll have schools go, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. It's wonderful because the person has less anxiety when they're at school and that sort of thing. And it, it's, it's not the typical result with the normal therapies that we're doing. You know, there's this long, long years and years worth of et cetera and you don't necessarily get very far. I don't know. Yeah. And it connects to this sort of comment that we see from, from Alan. It says, can my son learn a build up resilience? With it? It's it's like a switch that turns on. It's the resilience um, simply is when you when you sort of are are in tune. Yeah. Resilience from something like if you get the body into a good place, people sleep better. They that one of the first things people say is he had a sleep or he or he woke up in the morning oh, one mum say after the first session this was a few years ago in seattle after the first session she came that he came in the next morning and she went he was 17 she said he had a puffy face like like a little kid she said he's never looked like that in his whole life so just getting the body into a place where it can go into full rest all that other work gets done by itself that myelin, that vitamin D, absorbing B12, all that stuff, and the body then generates its own resilience. So the trick is getting the body to want to go to that nice place. And if you've had a lifetime of, or sorry, where are my hands, being here, um, you don't necessarily want to change and go to somewhere else. So you're having to coax that system. And you can't boss it around. You can't intellectually say it. You've got to find a way that it will drop its guard and shift to another space. And if it will you you get rest and from rest everything you know i don't know it's just it's quite fascinating just how so when we say resilience that's what it is 
And so, yes, to that answer in lots of ways, but I haven't met your son. No, I don't know. <laughs> and, and I'd have to make him like me. So I'll have kids come on. Like I do a lot of Zoom stuff now. And I'll have, uh, quite rightly, people, you know, whether they're eight or nine, as the person was today, or um, 25, um, be very cynical and not want to be on not want to talk to me and have had enough experiences of things not working and being poked and prodded and, and et cetera, that they're quite aggressive. And um, we sort of just wait and find a space till they're interested in listening. And as soon as they do, then they're like, oh, that's quite interesting. And then you, you know, show them the exercise by the mum like we did today. And then, like happened today, this kid was so excited about doing the work in a week because um it looked meaningful to him and it looked interesting and so that's ha half the work's done from there because he's then open and he knows that he's safe which is hugely important mm -hmm. for all this work absolutely it's and it's and it's establishing that um that groundwork um and i think elaine brought up an interesting point here she says the sen world is still very much a, a box ticking culture so i think with therapies, and that's a really interesting point, is with therapies and provision broadly, I find that just from from the experience I've had with our families, being a witness is, you know, therapies and provision happen, happen to and for um, these young people, but not with. So it's involving them in the conversation and acknowledging, acknowledging and accompanying them there, right? Because it's- Yeah, yeah, which you know, we have to unlearn. Be, uh, to get there because we've got a hundred years of conditioning that tells us how to do it otherwise. So for me, I, I don't, from where I sit, I don't see the point in being too sort of angry about other therapies. I just, I love it when people are really open to to seeing what this can be and then embracing it with their work. So I, I work really nicely along OTs and speeches and psychs, and some beautiful psychs, and they're, they're so excited because they go, now I can talk to the person because their anxiety is less. They're not completely shut, and and then and then there's some room for movement. So there's this way in which um, everyone stops having to be the most important person in the room, mm -hmm. <laughs> except for the client. And it's yeah, it's a big it's a big change, and and that we're all the same. I think I think the beauty of this therapy or the the therapy, but the the polyvagal theory is you know that that understanding that everyone has a delicate nervous system and it's not there's something wrong with your brain, which is usually quite the reverse. People mm. are smart. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think I think that's the end of our questions. I think I'll end our session there. Um, so just for those watching, I see we have seen 15 viewers. That's amazing. Um, just uh, we'd love to hear feedback on this session. So I, I know I got a lot from it, but to really hear um, how you received it. Um, so what I'll do is post an impact evaluation form in the chat and I'll, I'll also send it to our registered attendees. So we'd really wanna understand um, if you got something from the session and to improve the quality of our work going forward. So, so yeah, that's a little plug there. Um, but thank you so much for coming on, Holly. It's, it was an absolute privilege and really insightful um, to learn about your work and, and the ongoing evolution. Um, so thank you. And we, I'm sure we'll be working together moving forward. So um, the start of, start of much more, but um, thank you so much. Um, lovely to see you again and thank you for listening to my weird and crazy world. <laughs> um, I'll talk to you soon and yes, Smile 2020 if you want to download that from my website. Thank so you. I'll, yeah, thank you so much Holly. So I'll be sending um, all the additional materials to our, our attendees today. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and so if we have a questions that come up, am I okay to send them to you? As, um, yeah. From yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Again, thank you so much. And we'll end the session there. So take care. Thank you.